morning. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's for Klaus and me and all the artists really a dream come true that this exhibition can happen here uh, in Sydney and uh, that we for the first time really have uh, a space of our own for our own for this show because it was commissioned for the Manchester International Festival um, and it's director Alex Pouls and the War Festival co-commissioner, um, the artist uh, and composer Heimer Goebbels. And, uh, yeah, it was really embedded no, in a festival kind of context. And here, thanks also to the amazing architecture of Penelope Seidel and Seidel Architects, it's really possible for the first time to see the exhibition with much more space and to see it with an architecture, it's almost like a city within the city or it's a little village, or it's really rooms of a house. And that leads us also to the catalogue, because so far, uh, as it has happened in a festival context, there hasn't been a book. Uh, and for the first time, thanks to John and Naomi and Bettina and also Poliana, it's not only that this exhibition has happened here, but also that the book has happened. And the book is very much like the show, because you can open the rooms when you open the book and go from room to room. And we are very, very grateful um, to David Maluf, who is also here this morning, one of our great heroes, and it's um, so wonderful that he agreed to write for the catalogue. We are talking this morning, there's so many links, of course, because he so early on looked into uh, the connections, you know, between time-based art and, and, uh, and architecture and, you know, in research of the Baroque, what appears to be an illusion, as he says, is reality. But there is also a wonderful link, if you think of, you know, 13 rooms as the rooms of a house, to his uh, uh, groundbreaking book, uh, Emerson Street, the street in Brisbane, where we have you know, really uh, the portrait, one can say, of, uh, of a house. So many, many thanks to uh, David Maluf. Uh, we'd also like to say that uh, this exhibition really follows very simple uh, rules of the game, um, in the sense of that we've observed, and I think that's always something curating comes from art. Uh, I have horror of this idea that the curator would, you know, uh, basically come up with an idea and then art would illustrate this idea. I think it has to be the other way around. The idea is in the art, the curator has to extract these ideas from the art and listen to artists. And Klaus and I have been talking a lot to you know, all the artists of the exhibition, and we've just observed that over the last year, since 2000, there's really been an ever-increasing desire to, a desire of artists to uh, somehow have live momentums, to have live experiences, and I suppose that has also to do with the fact that we live in the age of the internet. And in a similar way, like you know, in music, there's such an importance again of the live concert. In a similar way, in art, there is a desire, you know, towards this live uh, experience, towards intersubjective experiences. And we can see that in practices such as, you know, uh, Santiago Sierra, Tino Segal, Roman Ondak, Laura Lima, Xu uh, Zen. Over the last ten years, they've all worked with such projects where actually. You know, um, uh, the participants are forming a kind of a situation. It's time-based art, but it's not performance in the sense of that, and that's the you know the main rule of the game of the exhibition. Uh, that these works are not you know impermanent; they are not temporary. They are they have the same duration potentially as a sculpture. The only difference is that uh, after seven o'clock, I think the show closes at seven, they all walk home and then, you know, the galleries are empty. But potentially, you know, this could happen, it happens here 11 days, potentially these pieces could happen forever. Uh, they can also be reinstalled, they can be reenacted. that's also why the show tours. And it kind of ties in with something which was very, for me, very, very important, but as a teenager, the first artist I ever met was the playwright Eugène Ionesco. And I met him in, uh, in St. Gallen, in Switzerland, where I grew up. And he was very old then and was actually uh, doing some lithographs. He went into visual arts towards the end of his long life after, you know, being such a pioneer of absurd theatre. And whilst we talked, he said, whilst he's here in Switzerland, every night his bold singer is playing in Paris because they, for now more than 40 years they play this play every single night. So he says, that is, this is as permanent as a sculpture in a square. And for me as a kid, you know, this was an incredibly important experience and maybe planted a kind of a seed for such exhibitions where, you know, as we have it, as we have it here. The idea also that the works really only materialize um, uh, 
when a, you know, when a viewer arrives, and then at the end of the day, when the last viewer leaves, again, you know, dematerializes. And there we have obviously also, you know, many connections to, uh, to dance. What is interesting is that many of these artists who since 2000 have worked on this sort of time protocol have actually been very, very inspired by, by dance. And that's why such an immense honor and privilege that we have Xavier Leroy here with us. And he agreed to say a few words uh, also at this uh, press conference this morning. Um, Xavier is one of the great choreographers of our time. And we collaborated for the first time together in 98, and Klaus and I, together with Nancy Spector, did the Berlin Biennale. And we invited Xavier to the world of the museum, and that was kind of an early moment of you know, bringing dance uh, into the museum. And uh, it was in 99 when we did Laboratorium that uh, Xavier introduced us to Tino Segal. Um, Tino was then still a student. He's now one of the most well-known you know, visual artists of our time. But then see the student that really learned the craft from Xavier and then brought this whole experience into the visual art context. As Tino has told me in a conversation, and I'm going to quote him here, while visual art proposes that we can extract material from natural resources to then transform it and have a product that is there to endure, and that's obviously a description you know, of an object, of the old idea of the object. Dance transforms action to obtain a product or artwork and produces and deproduces this product at the same time. And that's very much you know, what's happening here. And so it's wonderful that uh, you know, we have Xavier here, who is one of the great inspirations for you know, this very specific art form. So you also must say that the project is not only you know, transdisciplinary, building these bridges from art to other fields, but it is also transgeneration. Because we have in the show the youngest artists are born in 1990, 1991, Clark Beaumont, the Australian participants in their first international you know, group exhibition ever. And the oldest artist is John Balesari, who is in his early 80s. So we have actually four generations of artists present here. And I see Klaus is just arriving, and we normally do this as a ping pong. So this was my ping, and now we have Klaus. <coughs> Pong, and then we're going to have more pings and more pongs, and then we're going to have a subject. Klaus, your pong. Yeah, in an interesting pong, we had uh, we prepared our agendas yesterday, and I made that very thick line saying at 11 o'clock press conference. Then I see Hans Ulrich calling, texting. So it's, it wasn't 11. Here we are. Um, I think one of the most important things in 11 rooms is that it is an exhibition that is in a way, by definition, overstepping. And that might be a very important point. Yesterday we gave a small introduction for some of the donors that made the exhibition possible. And we used three metaphors of, of how far is that exhibition overstepping. Just imagine you run uh, to a theater and you have tickets and they're great tickets and you look for them and you have to even call the theater director to get them, whatever, but you're running late. So you're running late and you have great tickets right in front of the stage. And the usher, the usher says, oh, you have to go all the way straight and then make a sharp right, open the door, there you seat. So you do this, you run, open the door, but you're not in front of your seats, you actually end up on the stage. I don't know if that happened to one of you, but it's quite a surprise, like, whoa, what do I do now? Another good example is when you are amongst colleagues and somebody says, oh, we should discuss something, but not here, come to my office. Come to that person's office and says, would you close the door? So already by closing a door, already by having a door in a gallery, galleries normally have no doors, you declare it a private sphere where something like a contract or like a very important negotiation could take place. Just imagine you're in a high rise on the 37th floor and you have to go down all the way and it's not necessarily the busiest time, it might be like early in the morning or so. So you're on the 37th floor, door closed, on the 36th the doors open again, in comes the person that's completely naked. So there you are, you can look down or pretend to play with your iPhone or 
tend to not see anything, but you're stuck with this person for 36 floors, 36 floors more down. So I think the 13 rooms have a lot of these three awkward, overstepping, more or less private moments that are quite different than regular life. And so it's not your routine show where you go and have a look. So you will like some of the works and I'm sure you will dislike some of the works. So, but at least the works will make you have an opinion. Also the experiences, you know, hopefully are very, very different from room to room, you know, in the sense that in some room, you know, it's silent. The encounter, you know, with the war veteran, you know, Santiago Sierra, you know, in other rooms it's conversation, you know, in other rooms it's movement, in other rooms it's standstill. So the idea is that, you know, none of these rooms sort of repeats. It's, it's, in this sense, it's not only 13 rooms, it's also 13 very, very different kind of um, experiences. One thing which is also maybe uh, important to add, uh, that's uh, also, I think, got to do with the fact that these works are here, you know, in Sydney and then will continue, is that for us this exhibition has reached now really the form we, we, you know, we want it to be and we can now be continuing 2014, um, um, we'll be 14 rooms, 2015 will be 15 rooms, and we wanted to avoid that it sort of becomes a roadshow because as you know, curators very often shows become successful, and then they go to four or five cities a year, and then they somehow die because the, you know it's sort of the artist lose motivation and uh, interest in going again and again to install work or showing the work again and again. So we decided on purpose to slow down, and we've refused a lot of offers to show this. We only show it once a year. You know, now here in Sydney. Next year we'll be again in Europe, and then it will slowly continue to evolve. And you know, each time we add a room, and obviously the local research then always becomes also part of the global research. So the young um, uh, Australian artist we found, Clark Beaumont, we then travel abroad and we become part of that international tour. We must thank very much Simon Castells for having pointed out to us and made us, you know, discover Clark Beaumont who really have never really exhibited before, you know, internationally, and have mostly shown the work before, you know, online. Pin and Pong. Yeah, short Pong, because I'm sure you can't wait to see the exhibition. We were inspired by very traditional galleries. Just imagine you go to the Villa Borghese, or you go to the Bodo Museum in Berlin. Traditional sculpture galleries where you have figures on pedestals, and you have groups of figures, I think it's always beautiful when you go into a sculpture gallery, you're always measuring yourself against the sculpture. You see, is this my gender or not my gender? Is this person older or younger? Is this person taller, bigger, fatter, whatever? Then me as a person, you walk around, you spend some time in the gallery with the sculpture. So for me, sculpture is really something that resonates your own space and pace, your own volume and your own time. So in this case, actually, I think 13 Rooms is really one of these very classical sculpture galleries because you walk in and you have a sculpture in each room. Rules of the game, Hans Ulrich mentioned it already, alluded to it briefly. You walk into a room, you have a sculpture. The sculpture is always a human being or several human beings. The sculpture should normally not be the artist him or herself. We have one exception. Exceptions are there to be. Uh, provoking the, the general rules, so we actually like exceptions. Uh, what Hans Ulrich said, that the sculptures walk home every night, is, when you think about it, visit the 13 rooms at night, nothing would be there. So I think there is also the component of imagination, which is very, very important. It's very important with which mood, with which curiosity, and, and with which kind of expectation you come. And, Despite the fact you have perhaps read about it, I think these expectations will be sometimes uh, changed because you might not want to lie down on the floor or you might not like being confronted too close with a naked person or you might not like being uncomfortable in a room that doesn't have sufficient light. So, But all of this is quite a roller coaster of experiences and the most important thing is I think that you please allow yourself to experience all these different rooms. We didn't call it 13 performances, we didn't call it 13 
scores or 13 stages. It's really 13 rules. And what Hans Ulrich and I were very surprised and liked very much when we first had it produced in Manchester, the Manchester Museum added doors and doorknobs. Because when you normally go to a gallery, you wouldn't have that, right? But it adds a privacy. So a door means it has a threshold. So it means it has a threshold. It means you are entering something. And I think that's an important component of the exhibition, that it's actually 13 distinct, distinct spheres, private spheres, public spheres, art spheres, spheres of shame, spheres of pride, spheres of experimentation. And that makes it really, really as, as a, a mood board, as, a, as an uh, assembly of all these different zones in one exhibition. Before we invite you now to visit this mood board, these you know, 30 very different also atmospheres and, and encounters, um, we, we could take questions. So if there are questions, we can open it up and we invite Xavier on stage. So I don't know if there are questions in the room. Um, what happens inside the room if there's no visitor and the door is shut? Does everything action stop or does it carry on? Is it important? Do we know? I think it is important. It is important that uh, by the rules of the game, the exhibition should continue when nobody is there. It was very interesting when we did the Marina Abramovich exhibition at MoMA. There were two chairs, one table, and she would sit in, in one of these chairs. And we thought she would sit in front of an empty chair with the table. So she would always sit there. And despite all our expectations, the other chair was never, ever empty. But I think it's very important to understand these words when I say sculpture gallery as a sculpture. If you have a beautiful marble sculpture in a room and you are not in the room, the sculpture should be there. And I think the self understanding of this exhibition. It's not an event. It's not like, hey, here, here the audience is coming, please go up on your pedestal. I think by our definition, the sculptures really will be there from the day, from the hours the museum opens to the hours the museum closes. Well, interesting is also that, you know, it, uh, that's the case for most of the works, and then some artists define it differently, you know, so some of the works, they don't reactivate it when a view on. Enters, but that's part of the definition of the artwork. And that leads maybe to one, one thing we forgot to mention, which is, you know, it's the question of the scar, because as these are not objects, how do these works travel in time? And it's obviously an exhibition which, you know, we hope could still happen somewhere in 50 years or 100 years, because there is a, a scar, a, a description of each piece, no? Um, and uh, it can potentially be re restaged, you know, it can be reenacted. However, the, the score is not everything. There's a lot of additional information. And that's something, you know, Pierre Boulez has always pointed out when a piece of music is played. It's not only the score the composer writes, it's all the knowledge around, no? Which the composer has. And, and in some kind of way here, it's the craft, really, of, of, of the, you know, the, the mise-en-scene of, of such a piece. And that knowledge, you know, the curators and, and you know, of course, so Klaus and me, but of course also you know, John and, uh, and of course Pauliana, the producer, we've been permanently in touch with the artists and they feed in you know, this knowledge you know, about the piece. And so that's why you know, none of these experiences is the same. It would be very important to preserve that memory for the past, particularly if it would be staged maybe in a couple of decades you know, by future generations.